so thank all of you for joining us today for our webinar on the EB-5 green card. My name is Dustin Saldariaga, and I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC. We're going to spend some time talking about the EB-5 investor green card, um, which is uh, well known, also known as the millionaire's visa due to the investment amount uh, that it requires. Um, today, we are very fortunate to have our firm's founder, Ian Scott, presenting on the EB-5. Uh, Ian has extensive experience preparing EB-5 petitions, and also his experience navigating the process of going through a variety of visa options, from student visas to the TN to the E-2, uh, really does inform the way that we approach uh, uh, visa applications, including the EB-5 at our firm. A few things before we get started. Our firm is a full service immigration firm. And while we do focus on uh, business and investor visas, including the EB-5, um, our firm does handle family-based cases. We handle humanitarian immigration cases. And really, uh, we welcome you if you have any immigration questions at all, uh, even if they don't touch on business immigration. We will be continuing this webinar series by doing at least two webinars a month, and we do these on a variety of topics, um, so please do uh, continue to join us. We'll be sending out an email after this presentation that will have a link where you can sign up for those future webinars. We'll also have a uh, the PowerPoint that you see on your screen in that email, um, and we'll have a link to our YouTube channel. And we, we try to post a, a good amount of high quality free information on our YouTube channel. So please do check that out. We will post this webinar to our YouTube channel as well as shorter videos. Um, and again, those really do cover a variety of aspects of US immigration law. So, so do take some time to check that out and that'll be in the email you'll receive after this presentation. If you have a question, please share it with us through either the Zoom chat box or the Q&A function. I will be actively monitoring any questions and uh, we'll either share them with Ian at the time they come up if it's relevant to what he's talking about or I'll share them with him at the end of the presentation. So either way, we do plan to get through all of the questions that are asked. Uh, so please send those in. Finally, this webinar will be recorded, as I mentioned before, and will be made available on our YouTube channel. So with that, I will pass it off to Ian to discuss the EB-5 in the context of the various investor visas. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dustin. It is great to be here. And yeah, so so as Dustin mentioned, I'm going to kick this off with just really talking about the different types of investor visas that exist. And you know, one 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 investor visa that exists that is different from the EB-5 uh, investor visa because it is a non-immigrant visa and has some other differences as well. As E2 visa, an E2 visa really is a visa that's only available to nationals from certain countries. And unlike the EB5 uh, investor visa, the investment amount is subjective with what when it comes to an E2 visa, and often that investment amount is a lot less than what we're going to see with EB5. And then also. There is no set number of jobs that have to be created. Jobs are important for an E2 visa as well, but there is no set of uh, set number of jobs that has to be created. The next investor visa that we do a lot of is a national interest waiver, uh, and that this is also a green card. Like the EB5, it is a green card. And what this particular investor visa is based on is an entrepreneur that's coming to the United States, and that entrepreneur is coming to engage in an endeavor that is in the national interest. So there. Could could be a number of different uh, things that rise to the level of being in the national interest. It could be a benefit to the economy. It could be the product or service that the particular enterprise is offering, but a number of different different aspects. The second important part of that uh, of a national interest waiver petition is that the uh, individual is well positioned to advance the endeavor. And then the final part of a national interest waiver petition is that the individual, uh, you look at the individual and you look at all of the positive characteristics associated with what the person's coming to the US to do and the uh, particular individual and ask the question of whether or not those rise to the level of uh, whether the labor certification should in fact be waived. 
The next type of investor uh, visa or investor uh, program that's available is the International Entrepreneur Rule. And this is a, a program that isn't utilized that often because it has some inherent uh, defects. Now, with this particular uh, area and all of the areas that we're going to speak about today, or all of the areas that I just mentioned, rather, that we are not going to speak much about today, but that we just went through quickly, there are independent and separate webinars that cover each of these topics. So there's e, we have numerous E2 webinars, we have numerous national interest waiver webinars, and we also, on, in particular on our YouTube channel, have uh, international entrepreneur rule webinars. But this uh, particular type of um, investor benefit uh, is, is associated with an individual that wants to come to the United States and um, meets certain requirements. So one of the requirements is that they have someone who's in some type of institutional investor that's invested uh, 250000 or thereabouts in their, their business. And then there are a number of other factors that we, we, we look at uh, in terms of the, a small percentage of ownership that the individual has to have and uh, and, and some other factors as well. Um, and then finally, we come to the EB-5 green card, and that's what we're going to spend most of the time talking about today. And just before we get into a lot of detail on the specifics of EB-5, uh, you know, just a, a brief overview of the program is that um, in, in March of 2022, there were a number of different uh, changes that were made to the program. So in, 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 in a lot of ways, the program was, was, was revamped in, in March of 2022. So the changes were, uh, were, were, were generally good, <laughs> generally good. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to spend some time on uh, during this presentation is running through, I think there are a couple of slides, uh, running through all of the different changes that are now in effect, because we're now about a year, almost a year, I think it was March 11th that the changes were put into place. And now we're about a year um, uh, into into those changes, so we actually do have a good sense of how those changes are playing out in practice. And I think that the final thing to say before we jump into this is that region, uh, the EB-5 program is really divided up into two areas. So one is, area is regional center, and we're going to, I think, talk about that a little bit more on the next next slide. And then the other area is direct investment. Now, now these two, and as we as we go through and describe these two areas, we are going to talk about the differences between the two, but uh, but for the most part, they are, to, although they fall under the same regulatory statute, uh, statute and framework, uh, they do have a significant amount of differences. So, and, and I think that the next slide, we're going to talk about some of those, uh, some of those differences. So the the first like you know in terms of when we look at the regional center versus a direct investment I think that one way to look at this is what is the typical profile of the investor so so you know what what would an investor look like under the different uh, different programs so with a regional center what we're looking at and just to give you an, as, an, as an example let's say that a major hotel like let's say a Hilton chain or something like that was building a, a you know a large uh, hotel in a particular area and let's say that they want to raise some money and they want to raise, let's say, you know, $500 million or some large amount of money. They could participate in an EB-5 program and have a number of different individuals who want to obtain a green card invest a certain amount in that particular program. And you know, with the regional center, though, the investments are what I describe as fairly passive. The, the, the investor is not going to have really any say or control over what happens with you know how Hilton builds their hotel or or what it is that they spend the money on, so this is a fairly passive form of investment. So the individual that that that, that applies here is really looking to you know it, it, primary reason is because they want a green card and they're really looking to invest the money and not really have to do very much uh, you know what much with that. And the investment, it's not, you know, that you'll never ever see in anyone investing in a regional center for the uh, return because the return on re with respect to regional centers is usually very low. Like usually it's a, usually it's actually a negative return because it would be more probably less than 1% um, of uh, return, but then they have very, very high administrative fees. Uh, so you might spend between 30 and, and 60 or $70,000 
and just in administrative fees when you are um, investing in a regional center. But you do get the benefit of sitting back and not having to create jobs and not having to run, uh, you know, run a particular uh, business or project. Uh, with regional centers, we always do warn clients that they are buying an equity investment. And uh, it's, it is an investment just like any other investment. If you go to the stock market and buy a particular stock, you could lose all of your money. Uh, the company could go bankrupt and you could lose all of your money. And it's the same thing with these. These are not guaranteed. And in fact, the documentation cannot say that there's a guaranteed return because that would invalidate the ability to get the EB-5 green card. Um, the other thing with uh, with regional centers, as we as we go through and describe the requirements of the EB-5 program, there is a requirement to create a specific number of jobs. Now, with that, the the benefit of a regional center is that a regional center indirect jobs can be counted. So in the example that I just gave where, let's say, Hilton is building a hotel, uh, you can count the jobs that the hotel is going to directly offer. Like, so they're you know going to have a front desk person, they're going to have porters, they're going to have people cleaning the rooms, et cetera. So that, those are going to be what are called direct jobs. But then you can also include indirect jobs. So you can say, well, because there's a Hilton hotel that's going in here, there's going to be a dry cleaner down the street, and there's going to be uh, a shopping mall and all of these other aspects that um, because, you know, because the, the the Hilton is there, and you can get an economist to write a report and describe the impact of the indirect jobs, and those can be counted towards the uh, towards the job. And sometimes that's very helpful because one of the obstacles of an EB-5 program is that there is a requirement to hire a specific number of jobs. And we're going to talk about the exact number as we go through the presentation. Um, and as I said, with a regional center, generally people, their their only goal is the green card, right? That's, it's, it's, it's not, uh, they wouldn't do it uh, otherwise. Whereas the direct investment, this one really is, uh, I think, much more applicable to entrepreneurs and individuals who really want control over the process, right? So they want control over who it is they hire, what it is they spend the money on, et cetera. And this can be an individual uh, that starts a business in the United States. Uh, they could have already been on an E2, for example, um, but then invests more money into their business. And there's we're going to go into the specifics of how much that investment is in a, a bit later, but invest more money in their business and really wants control over that process. And the uh, you know their potential obviously is going to be higher for returns because it is their own business. So the, the, the potential is is, is, is unlimited, really. And uh, as I said, with the direct investment, uh, only direct jobs are counted, indirect jobs are not. Um, and the other thing with the, the direct investment is the program is not subject to reauthorization. Now, what this means is that the Regional Center Program, it is uh, a program that has been initiated by a congressional statute. And that congressional statute has to be reauthorized every uh, certain number of years. And this can be a problem because in June of 2021, the program didn't did not in fact get reauthorized and stayed um, that way until March until they implemented the new rules in March of 2022. So the regional pro uh, central program actually uh, paused or stalled during that period. Individuals were still able to invest in the direct investment program during that period, but uh, not the regional center program. So the direct investment program does not require re reauthorization from Congress. So there is a little less risk associated with investing in the regional center uh, pro program. Um, and as I said, a lot of some people that already have E2 visas, for example, um, and they've started a business and they've already invested money into their business, they could, in some cases, utilize the uh, money that's already been invested and count some of that money towards the uh, EB-5 investment. So something something to consider. Perfect. So now we're going to go into the actual EB-5 requirements. And I talked about the, you know, having to invest a certain amount of money. And uh, we see on the slide that the investment amounts are going to be either $800,000 or $1,050,000. So that's investing those amounts in what's called a new commercial enterprise. And the new commercial enterprise does not have to be an enterprise that is new, as, a, as, this, as the right statute uh, implies. It's an enterprise that was formed after I can't recall the exact date, but sometime 1990, some some date in, in the 1990s. So we can be, you know, an enterprise that has been around for a long time um, and 
investments can be made over time, but uh, but uh, yeah, it can be an investment, an, an enterprise that's been been around for a long time. Now, what differentiates the eight hundred thousand from the one million and fifty thousand is where the enterprise is located. So, if the enterprise is located in a what's called a targeted employment area, which is defined as an area where the unemployment rate is one point five times the national average, then it's going to be the lower investment amount. If it's located in any other area, um, sorry, if, if it's a targeted employment area, the lower investment amount. There's also another way it can be uh, the lower investment amount, and that's in an area what's called a rural area. And so that's going to be defined by the local jurisdiction based on lower population numbers. So not, you know, not an urban setting. So um, and then everything else is one million and fifty thousand. So so that's uh, that's how that that's how that works. And when we talked about, uh, you know, some of, the ch some of the, the changes to the program that occurred in March, uh, one of the biggest changes to the program was an increase in the investment amount. So the old numbers were 500,000 and 1 million. Um, so 500,000 for a targeted employment area and 1 million for a uh, for all other. But now we see the targeted employment area number has jumped up quite a bit, while the other number has, has just jumped up a, a, a very, very, very small amount. So um, with, with looking at um, EB-5 investments, you do have to be careful with respect to you know, what can be included. So when you're looking at an E-2, for example, many things can be included, including legal fees and administrative costs that you pay to an accountant, for example, and things like that. But for EB-5, uh, the, the statute explicitly ex uh, prohibits inclusion of those types of things as investment, uh, you know, administrative costs, for example, like legal fees. So you do have to be careful because you you know, you have to invest the amount. So if you're doing a regional center in a targeted employment area, or sorry, if you're doing a um, direct uh, direct investment in a targeted employment area and you invest, uh, you know, 800,000 and then 50,000 of that related to administrative fees or legal fees, then that you wouldn't meet the the requirement. You, you, you know, you, you just on the, on the, the plane, the surface, you wouldn't meet the requirement because you couldn't include the fifty thousand dollars is investment. So something something to keep keep in mind. <clears throat> The investment can be made over time, so it can be that you know we we did a, an EB five direct investment where it was a farm, and the person had an E two visa, and they had invested at that time the investment amount was one hundred five hundred thousand dollars, and they invested one hundred thousand dollars over a, but a ten year period, and we just had to you know add up the uh, the amount and show that the person had had actually met the uh, you know met the requirements. So. The investment can be made over time. Uh, another key thing to remember is the investment can't be retained earnings, right? So, with with the what we mean by this is that if you have a situation where the um, let's say, for example, someone has an E two business and they invested a hundred thousand dollars, and then the business generated. Uh, two million dollars in in year one, and there was a, a million dollars in in profit. Um, so then that million dollars sat in retained earnings, and then it was spent the next year on equipment and staff and different things like that. Well, that million dollars that was spent on equipment and staff is not investment because it's it's uh, investment has to come from outside the company, and it has to be made. Um, uh, made from it come from your personal funds. So so that's uh, something something to keep in mind. It is you know very different from uh, from from an E two because uh, an E two doesn't have that does not have that requirement. Um, the other kind of differences between this and an E two, um, you know, we 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 talked about this a little bit at the beginning. E two doesn't have a specific investment amount, doesn't have a specific employee amount. We're going to talk about the employees in a second, and uh, also the other big difference is that the EB five has a much more extensive review of the source of funds. So source of funds is something that it both uh, on on the face of the statute, uh, when you read it, it looks like the statutory requirement for E2 and EB5 are similar or the same, but uh, the scrutiny that is given for EB5 petitions um, is is quite a bit more than E2 petitions. So that's another big, uh, another big, big difference. Um, and the investment does have to be an equity investment. It can't be like a loan or something like that that you're giving and there can't, can't be any guarantee of the return of, uh, of the return of funds. Um, so the other big thing about EB-5 is job creation. You are required to create 10 full-time jobs, and um, that is full-time 
not part-time and it is uh, jobs for U.S. citizens and green card holders. So it is very important as you're going through the process um, that you um, make sure that the people who are providing documentation to you uh, saying that they are U.S. citizens or green card holders are actually that. So it, it is good if you're going through an EB-5 program to use an e-verify system because that check is done at the beginning um, when you hire a person rather than them just say, for example, showing you, you know, a photocopy of their passport or their green card and things like that. Because if later it turns out that those are fraudulent, then um, you're out of luck, not the, the individual that because the government um, doesn't care that you you weren't aware. So um, when you are doing a direct investment, then you're going to, you know, there, there, there's no requirement to, um, to have the jobs created when you apply. Uh, you have two years, two and a half years, actually, after the I-526 petition has been approved. And we're going to talk about what the I-526 petition is to create those jobs. So usually uh, an EB-5 petition can be approved with a business plan. So, you know, it can be a business that really is just a startup and uh, that uh, very little activity or even no activity at all uh, in terms of clients and customers, et cetera. And if you have a strong business plan, that would be sufficient for um, the approval of the I-526 uh, because this, this, unlike some other visas, like even E2 to some extent and, um, and, and national interest waiver to some extent, depending on what you're qualifying under, um, this, this particular um, category doesn't require that the business is, is as far along. It does require that the funds are committed or at risk. Um, so if you, you know, you can't just put, if you're doing a direct investment, you can't just put a hundred, you know, a million dollars into a, a business bank account and then make a business plan and then apply for an EB-5. Um, it, the million dollars wouldn't have to be spent. It would be good to have some of it spent and then um, have commitments for the rest. So commitment might be a lease commitment. It might be uh, commitments of like em employees and things like that. So all of those things are going to be helpful for um, showing that the money actually is committed. Uh, so, it's a, so even that is a little different from what is the requirement is for an E2, because an E2 is going to require that the funds are not not just committed, that they're actually at risk, So, which tends to mean spent. A committed doesn't necessarily mean spent, um, because committed can be a, you know, a lease agreement where you're required to pay money over a certain period of time. And in E2, you can only include the amount that you in the uh, amount of your investment that you've actually spent but for EB-5 that commitment is going to help you because um, the uh, it is going to show that over time that money is going to be spent so EB-5 has a bit longer term horizon that it looks at in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the ability to have the particular petition approved so um, the other thing to think about with job creation is that there is a requirement that there is a strong link between the funds that are invested in the job creation. And that's why, for example, buying a business doesn't typically work for EB-5. Like, let's say that someone, let's say that there was a business and someone was selling it for $2 million and it had 10 full-time employees and you gave the owner $2 million and said, I want to apply for an EB-5. That wouldn't work because the, you haven't, you haven't, the money has nothing to do with job creation. Uh, the only way that would work is if you actually, you know, let's say you took 50 50 percent of the company or some percentage of the company and then you uh, put the money into the um, into the business bank account and then it was committed after that that would that you know that that could work in terms of a um, uh, in terms of the money being related to job creation but then the jobs created would have to be created after that money was invested so the jobs that were already there would not uh, you know would not count in terms of uh, in terms of investment. And we talked about documenting the full-time workers. That's uh, you know making sure that they are are, are uh, you know have green cards or uh, are U.S. citizens. So the forms that are filed for EB-5, uh, you know, there's the same or similar forms. The I-526 petition is filed. If it's a regional center, it's actually called an I-526E, but uh, you know they're very similar forms. Uh, and this is the form that really says, you know, I've invested the the requisite amount of money and I uh, have a plan to create the U.S. jobs. And this particular uh, application does take quite a while to be adjudicated, sometimes uh, in excess of four years. 
And um, then the other petition that can be filed, if the person's in the United States, then they can file an I-485 petition. If they're not in the United States, uh, they have to wait till the I-526 has been approved, and then they would do consular processing. But one of the big changes in March was that the that now individuals can actually file an I-485 petition concurrently with the I-526 petition if their visa category is current. So that's uh that's uh something the 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 ability or the visa category being current is is probably the topic of a another whole webinar but uh but right now um categories are current for um, all individuals except for individuals that were born in china or india so and then finally, after the um, you the individual has the green card, then two years after having the green card, they would file an I-829 petition, which shows that the jobs actually had been created. So it is so the green card process associated with EB-5 is quite a long one, <laughs> uh, and um, you know not for the faint of heart for sure, but uh, but you know but it is a, a, a mechanism that many of our clients obtain a green card through because one of the Good things about it is that even though there is a long wait, now that you can, if you're in the United States, now that you, if you file the I-526 petition and the I-485 petition, you are given a significant amount of benefit. You're allowed to stay in the United States. You can apply for work authorization. You can apply for travel authorization. So all of that is quite beneficial. So. In terms of the program, uh, to the program changes that we talked about, so I recall mentioning that the regional center program requires reauthorization. So it was reauthor in March. It was reauthorized until September thirtieth, twenty twenty seven, and then the other really important thing was that they they put language into the. Uh, pronouncement that said that any petition filed before the 30th of September 2026 will be adjudicated because what happened last time was that the program froze and then there were many people who had applications pending but the government was unable to process their applications so that created I think quite a bit of instability in the program and um, it was a little embarrassing actually but um, the the uh, you know they, they weren't adjudicating people's petitions but now that that this change is, is uh, remedies that because if you file before the September 30th, 2026, you at least know that the government is going to continue to adjudicate your petition regardless of whether or not uh, the program is reauthorized. So I think it was an important change. We see the investment amount changes listed there as well. And then also one of the changes was that in the past, it was very, very easy to have a targeted employment area. Some targeted employment areas were in the richest areas of Manhattan. Um, and the reason they could do that is because they could link census tracts. Um, you know, you could say, OK, even if something's in, in the financial district and they're building um, a uh, large building in the financial district, you could link adjacent census census tracts all the way through up through the, the Bronx and and Washington Heights and and all these all these different places that do have higher unemployment rates um, to meet the standard that your uh, the unemployment rate was 1.5 times the national average. So they did make some changes to make that much more difficult um, to, to to kind of counter some of maybe perceived abuse of the program. And then they also did another big change, which is benefiting many of our clients is the they did a set aside for um, applications where the business is in a rural area, high unemployment area or um, infrastructure projects. So um, the key here is that that nationals from India and China. And the reason that they're delayed is because most of the applications are from India and China. Most of the EB-5 applications are from India and China. I believe over 90% of the all EB-5 applications are for applicants for, that were born in India or China. So, but what's happened is with the set aside, the new applicants get the benefit of um, the visa category being current. So if, if you have specific questions about that, you know, de definitely set up a consultation um, because it is a complicated area that um, would take a bit of time to, to, to explain. Um, Okay, so so the first bullet point um, we can ignore because it's it's dated now because um, the uh, it's but it really it just it basically clarified that the applications that were filed before the uh, June thirtieth date when the program paused would be adjudicated. Um, and then we talked about the um, ability to file the I four eight five concurrently, and with that you can file travel and work authorization. 
And uh, they also made the change of making um, administrative fees. Before, you just had to do source of funds information for the investment amount. So in this case, maybe the 800000 or the 1050000 $1, But now they've made a change where you're required to uh, show source of funds information for all administrative fees as well. Um, and they did clarify loans and gifts that they can come from anyone, um, because I think that one of the changes they initially wanted to do was make it so that the gifts in particular could only come from immediate family and uh, family members. And then they did make some changes to, you know, if if something happens, like a catastrophic event happens to a regional center, then there might be some remedy to be able to uh, you know, some remedy to be able to um, still continue in the EB-5 program, because before what would happen is if, uh, you know, if even if if a tornado came and destroyed the, the you know, the, 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 the project that you were, you had invested in, uh, you know, you were just out of luck. And so there's, there's some remedy now in certain instances to, um, to be able to continue in the EB-5 program by substituting and different things like that. But again, a complicated area, so very fact specific. Perfect, and Ian, we are at the halfway point and I just wanna, wanna remind our, uh, our audience, if you do have questions, please do go ahead and send those in. Perfect, excellent. So um, some of these we talked about during the presentation, so I probably won't spend much time on them. Um, you know, the, the, the at-risk investment. So, you know, this, you can't just put a you know, million dollars in a, in a business bank account. You do have to show that it's either at risk or committed. Um, we talked about loans and gifts and loans and gifts for EB-5 are fine. You can have unsecured loan, you can have secured loan. Um, the only loan that is not appropriate is a loan where the um, assets are secured by the business. Sorry, the loan is secured by the assets of the business or the business. So seller financing or something like that wouldn't work. Um, but gifts are fine as well. You do have to, if you do have a gift, you want to make sure that the gift, um, you know, that the person who's giving the gift has paid the appropriate gift tax in their country, because these petitions are going to be adjudicated years after the fact. And um, the government will look for proof that it was a bona fide gift after the fact, right? So, so you do have to always look at that. Um, we talked about considerations with purchasing a business that generally it's not going to work unless you purchase it and then turn around and invest money in that particular business. Um, there's no requirement with respect to how much you own, but the investment does have to be an equity type investment and you can't have any guaranteed type of return. Um, and we did talk during the presentation, I think we talked about some of the differences um, between moving from a, moving from an E2 to an EB5 and what some of those uh, considerations are. So we can we can move by that. Okay, so this is um, something, it's a case study, but it really just it's just something to illustrate a few of the points that we talked about before. So in this particular case study, we have a, an E2 investor who's uh, invested $300,000 in, two, two, in 2015, and she bought a business. So she bought a business from someone. So gave someone $300,000 and then took the business. The business had five employees at the time, and she paid lawyers $40,000 in fees. So $340,000 she spent already, right? Um, at the end of 2019, she took another $500,000 that was given to her as a gift, and the person who gave the gift came from sale of property and the, you know the property came from something that was inherited many years ago 15 years ago and instead of giving the money to helen the person put the money directly into the business bank account the the, the person that gave the gift put it directly into the business bank account so as i said these are just to illustrate a few different points when the um, when the when that additional five hundred thousand dollars was invested into so that was put in the business bank account, the business had ten full time employees, so five more than it had before, right? Because it had five at the beginning, and now it has ten. Um, so she fi you know she hired five more, and at the end of two thousand and nineteen, she paid herself a bonus of a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, after the company made a million dollars, right? And then in January, she applied for a green card and she said, well, I've invested a bunch of money. I've, I've invested $1.8 million, a 300000 initial, the 500000 and then the million dollars of retained earnings that I earned. And uh, she and I have created the 10 full-time jobs, so I'm good to go. And um, she doesn't want to hire any more people as well. And um, the, she's, she's, you know, she, her business is located in somewhere where the unemployment rate is 7%, right? So that's that's um, would classify or qualify for targeted employment area because right now the 
unemployment rate is three point something percent. So that's definitely more than that's all two over two times <laughs> the uh, national average. So so now let's just go through a couple of things that this case study um, illustrates. So a couple of things. The first thing is the money that Helen spent on the E2 visa to buy the business does not count for an investment for EB5, right? Because it, it was paid to uh, the seller and it, it doesn't count. So the other thing to keep in mind is the five full-time employees that are there don't count either, right? They, they you know, they, they, they were, that, that investment doesn't count and the investment has to be linked to the employee. So the five full-time employees don't count. And the other thing uh, to keep in mind now is the $40,000, that can't doesn't count as investment. But also, um, if that $40,000 was used for legal fees for the EB-5 case, which in this case it isn't, but if, uh, if it was used for legal fees in the EB-5 case, then we also have to provide uh, source of funds information for the $40,000. Not It's not included in investment, but we still have to include the source of funds information. So now... We say that the you know the in 2019 um, uh, she she you know there's another five hundred thousand dollars that was given to her as a gift. And now keep in mind this person put the money into the business bank account rather than giving it directly to Helen. So this is a big problem for EB five. EB five requires that you have possession and control of the funds um, before they hit the business bank account. They were regularly denying petitions where people were investing in regional centers, and the the parents, for example, would give a gift to their child, and instead of sending the money to the child, they they sent the money directly to the regional center. They didn't want the child to have the, their hands on the money before, and uh, they sent it directly to the regional center. But but USCIS was denying those petitions, saying that the investor didn't invest, the child what, who was the investor didn't invest. So that's a big problem, the 500000 being put into the... But but if it wasn't, let's say the $5,000 was given to Helen, then you know that could be a legitimate investment amount for the purposes of EB-5. But what would have to happen is that we'd have to show where the person who gave the gift got the money from and that they paid whatever gift tax. And you see, in this case, they got the money from property they inherited 15 years ago. So obviously inherited means someone died, right? And uh, but so but that but but it doesn't matter. USCIS does not care how long ago it was. They you would have to show money, show documentation related to where the person got the money the person who's no longer alive, got the money to buy that property from, right? So there's quite an extensive audit trail that's required for EB-5 uh, regional center regional center. Um, so now we have, um, you know, and she says she has 10 full-time employees, but keep in mind that only five of those employees count, right? Because it, it, there, the, there has to be a link. So let's say we say the 500, we're assuming that the 500 can be included. So let's just changing the example a bit and saying that the money was given to Helen, then Helen put the money in her business bank account. Um, but then we're only up to five, five full-time employees uh, right now. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is it says in 2019, she paid herself a bonus of $100,000. Now, you always have to keep in mind when you have, when you're very close to the investment amount, um, the total investment amount, you have to take pay particular attention to any money that's paid to the investor. Because, you know, let's say you have an example where you invest $800,000 in a company, the company doesn't make any money in year one, and then you pay the owner $100,000. Well, that sounds like you've only invested $700,000. Well, and whether it sounds like that or not to you, that's how the USCS will interpret it, that the that your investment was only $700,000 because you paid yourself $100,000. So you do have to be very careful, especially when you're investment amount is right around the uh you know the 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 minimum the minimum amount um to make sure that you're not going to run into run into difficulties and um you know so so those those are the inherent problems with this particular uh, particular example um that um you know she thinks she has 1.8 million dollars in investment oh so the final thing is the million dollars of retained earnings that is not investment at all right that's uh, that's just uh, money that the company made and even if that was spent in the following year that is not going to be considered investment Perfect. So, you know, one of the biggest things with EB-5 petitions is timing consideration. So uh, EB-5 is, uh, you know, it takes, every single petition takes a long time. So the I-526 petition takes 
um, uh, for you know four years or maybe even longer to be adjudicated. Um, and then we talked about country specific quotas. So um, right now, China and India are are delayed in terms of timing in all categories except the carve out categories. And as I said, if you have specific questions about those carve out categories and um, retrogression, retrogression is the concept of uh, when a, a visa category or green card category is not current, uh, you know, we do encourage you to set up a consultation because it, it is a complicated area. Uh, if you if you're in the United States on a particular visa, you'd have to kind of consider um, kind of dual intent considerations and and when you're it, it, when and if you have to travel during that period because the, the travel authorization can take a year, eight months to a year to be adjudicated. So you have to kind of plan everything um, accordingly. And there often are situations where people do parallel green card strategies. We have one individual who she was approved for an EB five direct investment, but then she actually did a um, she's, you know, in the process of doing a national interest waiver as well, because if the national interest waiver was approved, she would not have to, you know, go years through the process of filing an I-829 petition and different things like that. So planning really is key for, for all of this. All right. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, send those in. Otherwise, uh, Ian, I think you covered everything. Um, so thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you for taking the time. Please do keep an eye out for our follow-up email and we hope to see you on future webinars. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.